Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebrian, and you are watching part four in a five-part series on what musicians can learn about practicing from current brain research. If you haven't watched the first three parts, I've linked them below for you. If you have, you're probably wondering why all of a sudden my hair is much longer. The reason for that is I have wanted to redo part four, the part about sleep, for a while now. I just haven't had time. Um, and the reason that I wanted to redo it is because I wanted to include research on sleep deprivation, because I think that's a really par important part of the conversation and the story here. So I finally have time. It is more than a year after I originally recorded the videos. I have not had a haircut. So that's why I look different. But here we go. Let's talk about sleep. People that know me know I can talk all day about sleep. I'm constantly talking about the importance of sleep. My students get really annoyed at me, I think, because I talk so much about sleep. But it really is a very important ingredient in performing well, learning things, practicing well, and maximizing your time. So before we start, I'm going to do a quick commercial for a book, this book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. He is one of the leading neuroscientists on the study of sleep, and this book is incredible. It's fascinating. It's just amazing. I can't say enough good things about this book. I promise I get no money from the sale of this book. I just think everybody should read it. Um, I have given it as a gift to, I can't even tell you how many people at this point, everybody that I've told to read it who has read it, they start going out and telling everybody they know, oh my gosh, this book is amazing. You have to read it. So go get the book, read it. It will change your life. We're going to start our conversation today about sleep with a series of studies that was done by Matthew Walker, the author of the book, from the early 2000s. This is actually how I knew about his work long before the book came out. In these studies, he trained people to do a button press sequence on a button box as quickly and accurately as they could. So labs that study motor learning often have little things called button boxes. Often they have four colored buttons on them and people have to learn to press the buttons in whatever order they are required to as quickly and accurately as they can. And so that's what was done here in these studies. So this graph here is showing his control group. So these people um, had a pretest to see how well they could do this before they were trained. And then they had a series of training trials, as you can see on the bottom. And then they had a few retests. So if you look at the black squares, um, that is the training trials. And you can see that they gradually get better as they practice. No surprise there, you practice, you get better. And then on the right hand side of the graph where it says retest trials, they were retested on how well they could do this sequence every four hours. So every four hours they would get tested twice. They would have 30 seconds to do as many of these sequences as they could and they were tested on how many sequences they could do and how correct the sequences were. And you can see that this sort of linear progression of ability continues, right? They continue to get a little bit better in a way that you can basically predict. That's what that straight line is. That's the prediction line. So there's no surprise here, right? You practice, you get better. You continue getting tested on it. You continue to get better. Um, but he's interested in sleep. And so next he had people go home and go to sleep and he would see what happened the next day. And this is where the results get really, really interesting. When his control group came back the next day and they were tested again, suddenly there was a huge jump in their performance, as you can see from these graphs. So the top graph is showing speed. The bottom graph is showing error rate, number of mistakes. The black bars are showing how well they did on the first day. The stripy bars are showing how well they did the next day when they came back after a night of sleep. And you can see suddenly they are much more accurate and much quicker. But maybe it's nothing special about sleep. Maybe just a certain amount of time has to pass and then you know you get a lot better after that amount of time has had to pass. So he took another group of people, trained them how to do this button press sequence, but they didn't get to do those retests, those six retests. If you think about it, that's additional practice, right? So they were trained at 10 a.m. Then 12 hours passed and they had one retest at 10 p.m. And then they were sent home to go to sleep and then they came back the next day and were tested at 10 a.m. the next day. So this graph is showing how that group did. So you can see between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. They do get better, but it's not this big dramatic jump. The big dramatic jump comes when they come back the next day after a night of sleep. Same thing as that first group. The jump happens after a night of sleep. To make sure though that it's really, really sleep causing this, he had another group of people trained them 
and they got no retests. They were just trained and they sent them home and they came back the next day. They had their very first retest the next day after a full night's sleep. If it's sleep causing this huge jump in ability, you should see that jump at their very first retest on the second day. If it's not sleep, you shouldn't see that jump. So let's look at what they found. In fact, you do see this big jump. So again, these people were trained and then sent home. They got no retest opportunities. They didn't get to test how well they were doing. They were just sent home to go to sleep. Next day they come back and you see they get this big jump. They also tested these people again 12 hours later that same day. So their, their first retest was at 10 a.m. They tested them again at 10 p.m. And you can see there isn't a big jump there. So the 12 hours that seems critical for producing this big jump is when people are sleeping. So this is like magic, right? You go home, you go to sleep, and then suddenly the next day you're like so much better than you were the day before. Why, right? What is happening here? So they had another group of people sleep over in the lab so they could see if they could tell what was going on when people were actually sleeping. This graph shows what they found. Don't worry, we're gonna break it down. But in a nutshell, it shows that there was a very strong correlation, we'll also come back to that word, between the amount of time people spent in something called stage two NREM sleep in the fourth quarter of the night and the amount of improvement they made the next day. What in the world is stage two NREM sleep in the fourth quarter of the night? Because that clearly has something to do with this. Okay, so you've probably heard of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, when you're dreaming and your eyes are moving around really quickly behind your eyelids. So the opposite of REM sleep is very creatively non-REM sleep or NREM sleep. So that's what that part means. The stage two part is referring to different stages of sleep. So stage one sleep is considered very light sleep. It's very, very easy to wake you up. Stage four sleep is that super deep sleep, like you are out cold, an alarm is gonna be blaring in your room and nothing is waking you up. You're gonna sleep through that alarm. So stage two sleep is on the lighter side, but not the lightest kind of sleep. All right, and then finally we have this fourth quarter business. So sleep scientists consider eight hours to be a full night's sleep for adults, and they divide it into two hour quarters. So the fourth quarter is the last two hours in an eight hour night's sleep. So I wanna highlight that. For all of you that are getting six hours of sleep or less, you cannot possibly get this benefit because you're not reaching the fourth quarter. All right, so to come back to this graph, they found a very strong correlation between the amount of improvement people made the next day and the amount of time they spent in stage two NREM sleep in the fourth quarter of the night. Now you know what all that means. All right, so this word correlation that I said we'd come back to, you have probably heard the phrase correlation is not causation. So what that means is just because two things are correlated, just because two things are related, you cannot say that one causes the other. So A could cause B or B could cause A or C, some third thing you're not even measuring could be causing both of them. You just don't know when you're dealing with a correlation. In this particular study, they think this relationship is probably causal, that spending more time in stage two NREM sleep in the fourth quarter of the night causes more overnight improvement based on other sleep research that has been done. Namely, other sleep research has found that all of the changes at the synapse that are needed to happen for learning to occur, which I talk about in the first video in this series, all of that synapse changing activity happens predominantly during stage two sleep. It also happens predominantly late in the night, so the fourth quarter of sleep. For a motor skill like this, NREM sleep is really important for those changes in the brain to happen in order for learning to occur. So when you spend more time in stage two NREM sleep in the fourth quarter of the night, it gives your brain more of an opportunity to make the necessary changes that support learning. And then the next day you go do this thing and you're much better at it than you were the day before. We'll talk more about the um, role of REM sleep, NREM sleep, and late in the night versus earlier in the night, a little bit later in this talk when we talk about sleep deprivation studies. Another interesting detail from this study that I want to highlight that I didn't include in the first version of this video, which is another reason I wanted to redo it, is they had one more group of people train double. So instead of the normal amount of training that everybody else had, they gave one group double the training. They tra trained for twice as long because they wanted to see if that would make any difference. And it didn't. In fact, those people were no more accurate at the end of the first day than anybody else that got half the amount of training as they did. They were a little bit faster, 
um, but they were no more accurate. And they still got the bump the next day in performance, but it wasn't a bigger bump, it was the same. So double training didn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. That's really interesting for us as musicians, right? Because we tend to over practice things and we think that that will give us more of a benefit, but it seems like it doesn't necessarily, that it's just a waste of time. Um, so get it good enough for the day, leave it, go to sleep tomorrow, and you'll start at a much higher level than if you had continued to practice, 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 practice for hours on that first day. All right, so these results are pretty convincing, right? That you practice something, you sleep, and then the next day you're at a much higher level of performance. That seems like magic, it seems awesome. I would much rather sleep than practice. But if this is true, if sleep has this really dramatic effect on learning, you should see when people are deprived of sleep that they don't exhibit this effect, right? If sleep is necessary, sleep deprivation studies should show that you don't get this effect when people are deprived of sleep. So let's turn now and look at some of those studies. All right, in the first study, people had to learn a complicated motor task. It's not a button press thing in this case. It's kind of complicated. It's not even worth getting into. Suffice it to say, it's a complicated motor task. We have to do complicated motor tasks as musicians. And then they had a variety of different conditions involving sleep deprivation. So some people learned this task and they got to sleep normally. Other people learned this task and then that night they were kept up the entire night. So no sleep that night. Other people were allowed to sleep that night, but not the next night. Other people were allowed to sleep for two nights and then not the third night. And then other people were allowed to sleep for three nights and then not the fourth night. So they um, altered which night they got sleep deprived on. And then there were other people, some of them on that first night, they had to go to bed three hours after their normal bedtime. So they had to stay up three hours too late and then go to bed. Um, then there was another group that the first night they had normal sleep and then on the second night they had to stay up three hours later and then the night after that or the night after that that they stayed up three hours later. Um, so let's look at what they found in terms of learning. So everybody was tested a week later to ensure that nobody was doing badly on the test due to being sleep deprived. So it's a week later, they're caught up on their sleep, they're not sleepy anymore. But what you see is that the group that does the worst by far is the group that was kept up all night that night right after learning. So I learn it today and tonight I pull an all nighter. I'm really bad at this thing, even a whole week later. All of the other manipulations, that's all of the other bars on this graph, they were basically the same. It didn't really matter if they were sleep deprived on any other night. It didn't matter if they went to bed three hours too late. They were basically the same as the control group. The group that did really badly was the one that pulled an all-nighter and got no sleep that night right after learning pretty convincing that you practice something today, you better get a good night's sleep tonight, otherwise you're going to lose it. And you'll still be able to see that effect of the lost sleep a whole week later. So then the same researchers were interested in, well, is it just sleep in general? Is, is REM sleep more important? Is non-REM sleep more important? Like what kind of sleep? And so they designed another experiment to look at that. So in this experiment, some of the people got to sleep normally. Some of them were deprived only of REM sleep. So every time they went into REM sleep, which you can see on a brain monitor, then they were woken up and they weren't allowed to get REM sleep. Some people were only allowed to get REM sleep. So if they were not in REM sleep, they weren't allowed to be awake. Other people were allowed to sleep for four hours and then woken up. So they only got four hours of sleep. And then the final group got no sleep. They deprived them of sleep for the whole night. So the results from this are fascinating and not what you would expect, at least not what I would expect. So when they deprived people of REM sleep, it didn't seem to make a difference. When they deprive them of non-REM sleep, you can see in this graph, they do much worse. And again, these are people being tested a week later, so they're not doing badly because they're really tired. The two groups that do the worst hands down are the groups that got no sleep at all, no surprise there, and the group that was only allowed to get four hours of sleep and then was kept up the rest of the night. Look at that, they're doing absolutely horribly, but they got four hours of sleep. If you're one of those people that thinks you only need four hours of sleep, this should be really concerning to you, right? These people that only got four hours of sleep, they did worse, actually it's not statistically significant, but they did worse than the group that got no sleep. So only sleeping for four hours is just as bad as not getting any sleep at all. That's not to say to pull an all-nighter. That's to say getting enough sleep is really important.
So a question that arose in my mind from this study was, why didn't the REM sleep have an effect? Like, what's the point of REM sleep if it's not going to have an effect on learning if you're deprived of it? So this study, remember, was looking at a complex motor skill. And we know that the brain handles motor skills and, and cognitive skills differently, particularly in how sleep deals with acquiring those kind of skills. As musicians, we have to cultivate complex motor skills, but also music has a very large cognitive component, right? We have to be thinking and it's hard for our brains. So I wanted to look at studies that were doing cognitive skills with people and practicing cognitive skills and what effect sleep deprivation had in that case. So this study that we're going to look at, these people had to learn a cognitive skill. It's called the Tower of Hanoi. It's kind of a... Um, a problem solving task that you get better at with practice. And so same thing, the people practiced this task, they learned how to do it, and then they were deprived of sleep that night. Like the last study we were just discussing, they were either completely deprived of sleep, so they got no sleep that night, they were only deprived of REM sleep, or they were only deprived of non-REM sleep. So those were the different conditions. And of course, there was a control group that got to sleep normally. Here are the results of that study. So in this case, depriving people of non-REM sleep had really no effect. Um, you can see that they're not that different from the controls. The people that were deprived of sleep completely, total sleep deprivation, TSD, they did terribly. The group that did the worst was the group that was deprived of REM sleep. And this bar that goes underneath the graph what that means is that they, on retesting, and again, it's a week later, on retesting, they actually did worse than they did on their pretest before they were even trained on how to do this thing. And so depriving them of REM sleep the night right after learning made it so they were actually worse at doing this the week after when they were tested. That's really dramatic. And again, it's worse than total sleep deprivation, which is really interesting. Taken together, these series of studies I think is pretty convincing, right? On one hand, if you get enough sleep, you get this really dramatic bump in your ability to do whatever you were working on. That's awesome, right? You just slept and you're way better than you were yesterday. And then these sleep deprivation studies show that your ability to retain what you learned is really, really disrupted when you don't get enough sleep. So these attest to the importance of getting enough sleep for learning. I will not be on my sleep soapbox for very long, but I will say that the research on sleep shows that it is absolutely critical for learning. So if you are trying to learn something and you aren't getting enough sleep, you are shooting yourself in the foot. It's also really important for our health. Um, these videos aren't about health, so I won't say much about it, but um, the sleep book by Matthew Walker, which I talked about, goes into that a lot, how important sleep is for our health. And I think that's something that a lot of people aren't as aware of as they should be, although I think things are changing. That's it for sleep. Thanks so much for watching today. Hopefully I've convinced you that getting enough sleep is worth prioritizing. So I hope you'll join me for part five. It's about mental practicing and that research is really mind blowing also. I videoed that back in March, 2020. Right now it's May, 2021. So in part five, I go back to my short hair, um, but I hope you'll join me over there. And again, thanks for watching.